HeLa cells have been the focus of some of the most significant medical experiments to be conducted ever. These singular cells have assisted doctors, drug companies, and research institutes studying the effects of toxins, drugs, viruses, and cancer, giving hope in our fight against diseases like leukemia, polio, and AIDS. Immortal, as they've been described by scientists, HeLa cells have regenerated indefinitely for nearly 60 years, taking on qualities unlike anything else ever discovered. But their discovery came from a place of loss and sorrow, deceit and personal tragedy. They have turned sickness and pain into wonder and promise, but at the life of one woman. The year is 1951. The place? Baltimore, Maryland. Henrietta Lacks, an African-American mother of five, has just given birth to her youngest child. Lacks comes from a family plagued with poverty. At only four years old, she suffered the loss of her mother giving birth to her tenth child. Lacks' father, newly widowed, lacking patience and unable to deal with the responsibility of child-rearing by himself in Baltimore, rounded up his ten children, including Lacks, and carted them back to his home in Clover, Virginia, to a cabin that had once served as slave quarters on a plantation. Lax shared a room with her cousin, David Day Lax. Day was the son of her father's sister and later would become her husband. By the age of 14, Lax gave birth to her first child. Daughter Elsie followed shortly after in 1939, before the couple finally married in 1941. The young family, Lax, her new husband, and both of their children moved to Maryland where they had three more children, David Jr., Deborah, and finally Joseph in 1950. As would be expected, life was not easy with so many children. Her eldest daughter, Elsie, suffered from developmental disabilities, something the family found increasingly unable to deal with. After Joseph was born, Henrietta had little choice but to institutionalize Elsie into the hospital for the Negro Insane of Maryland, as she felt unable to care for her daughter in the way Elsie needed. Within a year of institutionalizing Elsie, Lax was confronted with her own health issues. In her own body, Lax felt something was wrong. Birthing five children prepares a woman with a keen sense of understanding of one's own body, and the irregular bleeding and excruciating pain Lax was enduring told her something was off. Way off. So, on January 29, 1951, she had Day, her husband, drive nearly 20 miles to the only segregated hospital in Maryland. Johns Hopkins Hospital. The public wards at Hopkins were filled with patients, most of them black and unable to pay their medical bills. After Lax entered the hospital alone, she told the receptionist, I got a knot in my womb, one she discovered in a self-examination. Since before she got pregnant with her daughter Deborah a few years back, Lax had endured an intensifying pain in her cervix, which only grew worse throughout her pregnancy with her last child Joseph. Lax was led to an examination room in a blacks only wing where the rooms had glass walls so that the nurses could easily see from one room into the adjacent one, as Johns Hopkins, as with every other institution in the 1950s, was racially segregated. The exam was to be carried out by one Howard W. Jones, a pioneer in reproductive medicine. What Jones found was an eroded, hard mass about the size of a nickel in the neck of her womb. This tumor, unlike other tumors, was purple in color and resembled grape jello, and bled at the slightest touch Jones described. Lack's tumor must have grown at an appalling rate, as no one in the last five months had discovered in either of her previous visits after delivering Joseph, Jones surmised before sending the tumor for testing. When the biopsy results came in, the 31-year-old Lax read nervously, epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix, stage one. Lax didn't understand. She had gone to Johns Hopkins to treat various STDs she contracted from the bad blood David sometimes brought home after nights with other women, but she had never returned for follow-ups, as indicated on the file Dr. Jones reviewed. As Rebecca Skloot points out in her book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax, Lax just wasn't comfortable in medical facilities. She wasn't educated in the traditional sense of the period and didn't understand what most of the doctors and nurses would explain to her. Like many others in her position and social class, Lax only went to Hopkins or any other hospital as a last resort. The biopsy results, Jones explained on her next visit, revealed something malignant. At his advice, Lax started radiation treatment immediately, wherein two cervical cell samples were taken and sent to the tissue lab of Dr. George Gay. Gay, a cell biologist who had been collecting samples from all of the cervical cancer patients at Johns Hopkins to conduct research on the then mysterious disease. But it wasn't the fact that the cell samples were malignant that grabbed the attention of Gay and his colleagues. 
They were regenerating at an alarming rate, doubling every 20 to 24 hours. During her treatment, Lack spent two days in the hospital. She had never stayed that long in a medical facility before. After the two-day stint in the hospital, Lax was sent home after she promised to return for more treatments within two and a half weeks. At one of her treatment sessions, she asked the doctor when she would get better and be able to have another child, much to the doctor's surprise. No one had informed her that the radiation treatments would render her infertile, which was already a well-established practice that Dr. Jones himself wrote a paper on. The note in her file about this incident says Lack expressed had she been told about this from the beginning, she wouldn't have gone through with the treatments. Unfortunately, that story is far more common than we might hope. Impoverished black individuals have been systematically oppressed for hundreds of years and continue to be to this day. J. Marion Sims, an American often called the father of gynecology, for example, used black women who were enslaved to experiment with potential remedies for fistula, holes between the vagina and the anus, without the use of anesthetics or sedation. His patients suffered years of painful torture and agony. To this day, black individuals are often given less pain medication for injuries or procedures than white individuals, due to a misconception that they inherently have thicker skin, according to NPR. Black women are also far more likely to die during pregnancy or in childbirth than white women. Lax died in Johns Hopkins Hospital on October 4, 1951, at the age of 31. Her cells, however, carried on her legacy and are still widely used today. Gay isolated and multiplied the specific cell line with the most longevity and durability, creating the HeLa, taking the first two letters of her first and last name, strain that was instrumental in developing the polio vaccine and can be found in almost every lab. In 1955, the cells were cloned due to increased demand. The Lax family didn't find out about the HeLa cells until the 1970s, when a scientist called and asked family members for samples of blood and other genetic materials to learn more about the HeLa strain. David, Lax's husband, who only had a third grade education, understood the scientist to mean, we've got your wife. She's alive in a laboratory. We've been doing research on her for the last 25 years. And now, we have to test your kids to see if they have cancer," Sklut said in an interview with Smithsonian Magazine. Any inquiries the family had about the use of HeLa cells and publications with their own genetic information included were ignored. The book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, was published in 2010, which was later adapted into a film with Oprah Winfrey, establishing a renewed interest in this predicament as well as in laws surrounding patient rights. In 2010, Sklut also established the Henrietta Lacks Foundation, which seeks to provide assistance to individuals and families who have been directly impacted by such research. As the Sims experiments mentioned above, the Tuskegee syphilis studies, the human radiation experiments, and others. This foundation is responsible for sending many of Henrietta's grandchildren and great-grandchildren to college. This new interest in the case prompted Johns Hopkins to release the following statement. Quote, At the time the cells were taken from Mrs. Lack's tissue, the practice of obtaining informed consent from cell or tissue donors was essentially unknown among academic medical centers. Sixty years ago, there was no established practice of seeking permission to take tissue for scientific research purposes. End quote. Johns Hopkins never patented HeLa cells, nor did it sell them commercially or benefit in a direct financial way. Even so, the doctors of the time, like so many in that era and still today, dropped the ball on informing Henrietta of the implications of her treatment. Not everyone's been happy with the representation of the family's story, however. In 2018, her eldest son Lawrence and his children Lawrence Jr. and Ron filed a petition with attorney Christina J. Bostick to obtain guardianship of the cells. Lawrence was unhappy with the lack of control his family had on his mother's story and the lack of compensation the family had received. Given that they had lived, and many have continued to live, in great poverty most of their lives. Among Lawrence's complaints were a lack of compensation from the selling of the cells, the book, and the film. Some members of the family received compensation for their help with the film, but nothing more than a salary and no one other than those who helped on set. Lawrence was suing for mistreatment, theft, misappropriation, and for profits earned without consent. He filed this petition in Baltimore County in July of 2018. Had she been white and financially wealthy, would Lax have been asked about the donation of her cells? That we don't know. But it definitely wouldn't have slipped the doctor's minds to inform her that her cancer treatment would leave her infertile.